Hello and welcome to another episode of Fortitude and Truth with myself, Andrew, and my dear brother in Christ, Nate. We are just kind of trudging along here in our in our somewhat prickly topic of the Christian in light of the civic sphere. Um, don't get me wrong, we've been enjoying this, and this is definitely needed conversation, um, but it, it, we understand that it can be, at times, either convicting or challenging or difficult. So by no means take our assessments as attacks or anything like that. But anyway, continuing today's train, we're going to be discussing Christian Christian nationalism. How are we feeling today, Nate, about, about this, this topic and just our series overall so far? Uh, first of all, I love the series. It's some dicey stuff, and I, I it's even for me, it's hard to wrap my head around. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we've figured that out by now. But I am really excited about today's excursus into Christian nationalism before we get to voting. Um, next week, you're going to a, a doozy, too. Um, <laughs> We're going to tell you how to vote. No. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, sure. Um, after today's show, I'm sure you'll figure out that we definitely won't. Um, <laughs> but there is a book that we will recommend um, probably by, by the end of the show. We'll reference a few times um, that I've been reading and Andrew's been reading and I've I purchased for a couple of our pastors to read that really engages this idea of Christian nationalism and and not just what it is, but how do we deal with this as Christians? Um, should we follow it? Should we not follow it? That whole nine. And so we're going to talk about a lot of that today. And so it kind of lines up really well that we've been reading this book. There's some other thoughts we have apart from from the book and some reading we've done. And um, I wrote a paper on kind of this, kind of not this, um, but like the, like Paul's example of nonviolent disobedience versus what Christian nationalism calls for um, as far as um, trying to take power and all that. So. I'm excited for today. I will try not to take over the show. Um, sometimes I think you guys can tell when I'm excited about things versus when I could uh, not care less is not the right word, but I'm less passionate about certain things than other things. Um, and I kind of sit back and just let them happen. So that will not be today's show <laughs> and probably not next week's show and, and hasn't probably been in a little while. We're talking about hermeneutics and then politics and like I'm clearly a little fired up lately. So. <laughs> Um, but we've got a focus passage, which is probably probably should be everybody's favorite. Yeah. And so, Andrew, I, I, if you'd I will read. take it from here. Yep. So our focus passage for today is Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Holy Scripture says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had des- designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came to up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, what a fitting passage. So, just just before we kind of really get going, just overall view today, we're going to be discussing first, obviously, what do we mean by Christian nationalism? Well, what is it? I'm sure, Nate, what we have discussed, we'll, we'll go in more in depth into that. And there's obviously multiple definitions, so trying to get those definitions hemmed in is important, get a proper understanding. Then we're going to go to, I'll, I'm not going to tell you because it's going to spoil our, our take, but <laughs> our, our uh, not just our take, it's not a hot take, but our position based on study and God's word. And then lastly, we're going to discuss something else kind of in line with that. So originally I was going wow, to tell people, and now I'm teasing it. it. Out. Now, I'm, now I'm teasing it. All right. So, Nate, tell, tell us, what is Christian nationalism? Um, it is. Uh, so there's a couple thoughts. So we're going to read, and Andrew's got a, a definition pulled up. One thing I do want to do today, and I don't know that I discussed this with Andrew before the show, so we're going to try this, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. We're not going to give you the names of pastors organizations or anything like that that is christian nationalism we want you guys to figure that out on your own i think that's important to recognize these things um to be able to discern these things and then be able to deal with these things because if we just tell you hey this person's a false teacher hey this person's a christian nationalist like then you have you're approaching their teaching with that pre that misconception and who knows i could be wrong right that's why if we do, if here's the other thing, if we do mention false teachers, we're pretty sure we're right. Yeah. Um, we're going to go out of our way to do our homework on that. We're not going to just, uh, maybe their teaching's kind of, eh, and then like, oh, I'm not going to call that person a false teacher because I might not agree with them and they're maybe teetering the line, but like, I'm not going to uh, 
overtly do that. Now, have we mentioned some names? Yeah, we have. But again, we feel very strongly about those. And, and um, I'm sure I feel strongly about some Christian nationalist organizations, but I think we're going to leave those alone. Um, those of you who know Andrew may have worked for one, uh, but we won't talk about that. We won't hold it against him. I promise. Uh, <laughs> so, um, there's a lot more to that, but yes. So I would say coming from a, an evangelical perspective, uh, we'll just start away from the book that we've been reading. Um, I'm not gonna give you the title yet, but Caleb Campbell says in answer to the question of what is Christian nationalism, American Christian nationalism. He says, American Christian nationalism argues that the American state should be run by Christians and should protect and promote the concerns of Christians over others. How this plays out varies among Christian nationalist groups and organizations um, that often emphasize different beliefs and attitudes toward government, history, and culture. Um, and really it turns down to, and I'll give you like the top 10 kind of common beliefs that they all pretty much share, more or less, they emphasize them in different ways. Um, some of them we can get on board with, honestly, if, if we just have to be careful if these are coupled together or not, like if it's only one of them, then yeah, that's cool. But when we start coupling things, coupling these things together, it gets dangerous. Um, number one is I want all Americans to follow Jesus. Amen. Like, I love that one. Um, the Amen. author agrees with that too. Right. Um, but the problem is, and he even says the statement is also often coupled with other, some of these other tenants and that becomes more harmful and dangerous. Um, historically, most Americans have identified as Christian. Eh, eh. American was founded on Christian values. Uh, eh. Again, eh. He makes some he makes some good cases. We just we really need to be to do our homework. I think we'd like to think that, and we would as Christians be like, oh yeah, that's a great great story. This was a Christian nation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that all sounds great, but like when you actually do your homework, like is that true? Um, the government should recognize Christianity as its official religion. The American government should oversee and fund the Christian church. The American government should promote Christian values. Kind of behind that one. Um, the American government should enforce Christian values. That's a little bit more touchy. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. The American government should be ruled only by Christians. Why? God has a unique relationship with America like his relationship with Israel in the Bible. Andrew's throwing up right now. Um, and if you heard my, uh, you, you probably haven't heard my sermon, but uh, if you go to Troy Christian Chapel's YouTube, um, and none of our other pastors, I think, have said it yet, but I, I preached a sermon on Judges, on uh, Judges chapter 1. And in the intro, talking, presenting some background about o OT history and and Israel, I, I came out and said it. I said, America is not Israel. We're going to leave that at that. There's no debate on that. We're going to close the book. So that is a evangelical Christian scholars take on Christian nationalism and kind of what they stand for. Um, I actually would like Andrew to read a cr definition of American Christian nationalism from somebody who is an American Christian nationalist. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to see kind of some of the similarities. Unfortunately, they're, they're pretty honest about it. Um, but just to see kind of where we stand and, and go from there. Absolutely. So I'll, I'll read the first definition and I can go through some of the things. They have a whole like a affirm and deny section if you want me to read certain portions of it. No, uh, I don't have to. I'm just saying. We, so, we'll see. Yeah. So the definition here. Christian nationalism is a set of governing principles rooted in Scripture's teaching that Christ, Christ rules as supreme Lord and King of all creation, who has ordained civil magistrates with delegated authority to be under him, over the people, to order their ordained jurisdiction by punishing evil and promoting good for his own glory and for the common good of the nation. That, that, I'm going to stop right there. That's, that, that's, the, yeah, that, that's the definition. That's, that's like, it? That's the one sentence they have. Well, because they, they have an introduction and like a whole bunch of affirmations to be, to say, be more clear. That definition doesn't sound terrible, right? That sounds very Romans 13-ish, right? God is the supreme authority, which we can all get behind. And he's ordained civic governments to punish evildoers, which Romans 13 says. So I, I don't see any issue there. But, Andrew, I think we should probably dig a little deeper. Yeah, that's what. So let's see. I'm looking at their firm and deny. Uh, 
While you're looking. Yeah, because there, there's, there's a little bit here, so let me, let me... While you're looking, there's an issue here that we should probably talk about because... And I think we, we often miss it because we just assume nationalism is like a nation, but the way nation is traditionally used and the way nation should be understood is not the way we understand it, I think. Um, so we talk about American Christian nationalism versus the state, right? So the idea of a state versus a nation, what's the difference? Well, the state is the American government. That's that's the state. If we were to say the nation, that's it's America is really made up of a bunch of different nations, right? We have like Christians and we have like, especially when the colonists came over, we had like the different nations of, of Native Americans, Native tribal peoples. Yeah. Um, we have the different nations of people that came over to America um, as far as different like cultures and belief systems and, and practices and things like that. Those that's really what a nation is. We talk about the nation of Israel. Yeah. And the Old Testament was a nation state, so, so to speak, right, where it was a, a group of people with a specific ethnicity and set of beliefs. But it was also it functioned kind of like a state um, until it didn't or it functioned like a nation without the state before it was a state. Like, I don't know how much statehood was really in a group of people just wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Right. We talk about the nation of Israel, but it's not necessarily the state of Israel. Now we have the state of Israel that exists, but the nation of Israel is all, all but lost um, to time, to history and to dispersion. And so we just have to remember that like even American Christian nationalism, and I still think nationalism is the right term is this, this focus on this, this group, right? They focus on themselves. They focus on how can quote unquote Christians, how can we as Christians being American Christian nationalists, how can we take over the government and rule the government and enforce all of our statutes, all of our beliefs on other people to make us one quote unquote nation, right? Even though it's really a state. Or not, they would not make it a state. They would they would try to make it a nation and turn the state of America into a, a quote unquote nation. We get we we get confused on this a lot though because like the terms like one nation under God, right? And we treat America as a nation because we'd like to think that America is one nation with a similar set of beliefs, but clearly the um, the varying people groups that have have in not infiltrated that sounds wrong. Um, have come to this country and live in this country and prosper in this country um, are, are many. Yeah, um, Really quick, if you'd like, I, I'll read the introduction, which is a few more sentences mm -hmm. of what they said. Um, and then there's a couple things, and I'm going to preface it with this. They're approaching with a very philosophic overview. Um, we can address that more in a second. But anyway, introduction. Christian nationalism is primarily concerned with the righteous rule of civil authorities, not spiritual matters pertaining to salvation. The desire for a Christian nation is not a distraction from the gospel, but rather an effort to faithfully apply all of Scripture to all of life, including the public square. As such, Christian nationalism is not just for civil authorities, just as submitting to Christ's lordship is not just for civil authorities, but for all people. After the Lord Jesus declared his sovereign authority, Matthew 28, 18, he gave the Great Commission and commanded his followers, empowered by his everlasting presence, to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them and to teach them to obey all that I have commanded. Matthew 18, or 28, verses 19 and 20. Our Lord did not exclude all civil authorities from the command to submit to his authority and display allegiance to him. We recognize the existence of other definitions of Christian nationalism. We certainly do not endorse every iteration of Christian nationalism and explicitly repudiate some such forms. As, we able, as will be evident with our, in our affirmations and, and denials. You may sign this document to, del, uh, to delineate if you affirm civil authorities legislating both the tables of law or only the second table after the article. Your Honor, it's okay. We affirm and deny the following presuppositions, or propositions, rather. And then it goes through, like, Article 1, the source of truth, and many of this we would agree with, but continue. All right, I didn't mean to... Yeah, it, it, it sounds, that, and that's why we want to be careful here, is a lot of this sounds all well and good, but then we get into it and we realize, is it? So I'm going to give you some some bumper stickers here that, that I you can do with what you want, um, but these these should, should give you a clue. Um, it says, my family and I are protected by the dear Lord and a gun. If you intend any harm, you might meet both. Conveniently positioned above a Jesus is Lord sticker. 
Uh, Jesus is my savior. Trump is my president, accompanied by a distressed American flag. A vintage painting of a European-looking Jesus figure adorned with a red Make America Great hat. Um, the image of two AR-15 rifles and the figure of a cross. God, guns, cops, and Trump equals America. Next to multiple, quote-unquote, F. Biden stickers. Um, stand for the flag, kneel at the cross. Um, Jesus, guns, babies. Now, the, some of those seem like kind of obvious, maybe a little tacky, maybe you're not a bumper sticker person, but there's clearly an, um, an equality that, that you think we see here. Andrew, would you disagree of like Christianity and um, being an American? Oh, I'm sorry. Are you, I'm sorry. Are you asking me, do I see an equality being made? Yes. Yeah, I do. Okay. And so, yeah, I think that's, that's another thing. So, and it comes down to when we look at these things as far as Christian nationalism is like we have to remember what a Christian is as a follower of Christ and then what this idea of nationalism is as far as like promoting this idea and so the author gives three things he says it's they promote their ide ideologies um, and they're very again like they're very of like a big dichotomy of ide ideology so it's basically if you're not for us you're against us um, there's clearly an idolatry there as far as political, um, so just, just to kind of help with the philosophic thing we were kind of talking about, they talk about the great commission article, uh, 13, it looks like, mm -hmm. um, and they, they talk about what we affirm. So if you don't mind, I'm going to read it. It's a couple sentences and maybe we can yeah. kind of help. So we affirm that Christ's commissioning of his church to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to obey all that he has commanded includes civil authorities who are to be called to repentance, faith and obedience by, uh, to Christ. We affirm that the church is to instruct civil authorities regarding their identity and duties as servants before the throne of Christ. We affirm that this duty is the, is a great commission issue. That's what they affirm. Okay. And then we deny that there is any sphere of life in which the command teach them to obey all that I have commanded does not apply, including politics and government. So in theory, that all sounds well and good, but yes. in practice, it's not. Well, and that's kind of was my point. I think here kind of you see this focus, this philosophic point right. that's being made. Because the commission is structured a specific way for a specific reason, right? If we, if we want to go back to the text... That like make disciples of all nations is first for a reason. If they're not a disciple of Christ, they're not going to obey what Christ commands. End of story. We can't make them obey what Christ commands if they are not his disciples. We can try. Yeah. It's not gonna end well. And what's what good is it to obey the will of Christ if you're not a Christian? Like it it, it seems kind of oxymoronic, right? You are, you're in covenant with the world. You're going to obey the world. You're in covenant yeah. with Christ. You're going to obey, obey Christ. Like, why would I now do those sometimes intersect? Do we see Christian morals affirmed in the government? Yes, but we also see the opposite is true. So the other thing to think about, two things I think are important here. So we obviously have this misconception of American history we talked about, right? This um, founding of a Christian Christian nation, right? Supposedly. Have you read the Declaration of Independence lately? Me? Yes. Oh, relatively recently. Why? Um, how many times is God mentioned? It depends. Like, you mean like the word God? Yes. The, the actual name God does not appear, but the creator, capital C, which oh, is in reference, okay. talks okay. about him. And how many, how many times is Jesus mentioned? Uh, to my recollection, well, technically, if you want to talk about the Trinity, we're not, but we're by not name. Gonna die, we're not okay. going to dissect but, that. But by one. name? He's not mentioned. Oh, okay, okay. I'm, I'm just curious, and and what is what is the declaration concerned with? Is it life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Correct. Oh, okay, and that's that's Christian, right? I'm sorry, I, I'm being very facetious right now. Um, so if we actually read the declaration, if we read the Constitution, um, yes, it's great that they're concerned with human rights, but like that's what they're concerned with. They're concerned with humans. They're concerned with themselves. That's what they're concerned with. Yes, were some of them Christians? Yes. Were a lot of them like Freemasons and other things? Also, yes. So we just need to be careful with this idea that we were founded on Christian principles and we are a Christian nation because 
I, I that's stretching the truth a little bit there. Secondly, the thing with Christian ethics, like yes and no. Um, I think it's one thing to to have. Um, we talk about like murder and stealing; those things are are outlawed, and those align with biblical ethics and biblical principles. But do we mandate the fruit of the spirit? Do we check in on the confession and repentance of our, our of our politicians? Should we? I mean, we've never have. Is that even? But is it? Here's the other thing: is that even possible? In a very, in the most true sense, no. Right, like. Can my pastor come in and check in everybody's repentance and their I mean, confessions? You can pray, but at best, like I said, prayerful. Like you can pray, you're never going to know their heart, which right. is the root of the issue. And that, that, so how do you police such things? How do you run a government on such things? You start publicly flogging people. Duh. That's what the Romans did. <laughs> I'm glad you picked up on that. Or, the, or that's what the Nazis did. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Wait a I, minute. Did I make a false equivalency there? Maybe, maybe not. But th- that's the thing, right? So, like, if we're gonna if we're gonna stand for Christian ethics and principles, and we're gonna stand for Christian ethics and principles, and then we started getting to dice areas, like, yeah, would I love those things to be real? Yeah, but the 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 idea of means to an end is probably not what we're called to do, right? And especially like means to an end becomes violent uprisings and and taking yeah. control of power, and um, ultimately too comes power for power's sake, like that's kind of what it's turning into is we want Christians in power to do what's best for Christians yeah. and everybody else can just deal because unfortunately this nation, whether we like it or not, is not predominantly Christian. Now, well, Even if they call themselves Christians, I would well, argue that they're not predominantly Bible believing Christians. Yeah, and and on, on this note, there's another article. It's the last one I'll read, but it's like, it's a couple sentences. So I'll read the reaffirm and we deny. We affirm that the church and the, so this is article 20 on neutrality and the separation of church and state. So we affirm that the church and the state each possess their own sphere of influence. For example, church officials ought not to write or enforce civil laws in their capacity as church officials. And civil officials ought not to administer church ordinances or dictate doctrine in their capacity as civil officials, even while both spheres are under the absolute authority of Christ. We deny that the separation of authority between the church and the state means there must be a separation of God and the state. We further deny that there can ever be a separation between religion and state, as everyone possesses views about ultimate reality, purpose, and cause, which inform their morality and preferred policies. We deny the idea that a nation's laws do not impose morality and religion. That's so funny. Every, everything I hear and everything I read is just, it screams like, oh, I, we can agree on these things. And in writing, maybe we can, but in pra- in practice and principle, well, and that- if you hear what these people spew and if you r- read these things and you see the politicians that kind of lump themselves in with some of these um, Christian nationalists, y- yes. like if you look at, um, she's a politician, so I have no problem saying her name, like Marjorie Taylor Greene um, is a very staunch Republican is and is, I would say, also a Christian nationalist. Um, I-, I mean... To, to be fair, she's compared Trump to Jesus, so... And I think that that from really... From his political suffering, which I make... Should... I, I only say that because she's a politician and she has a public platform. That is such nonsense. And I'm yeah. sorry if I've offended any... Like, that, is, that is nonsense of the highest order. Anyway, I'm sorry to continue. Yeah. I was just going to say, so American Christian nationalism has become a mainstream issue. U.S. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene began selling shirts with the words proud Christian nationalist and con- encouraging her constituents to purchase them so they can stand against quote, the godless left. Right. That's the other thing too, that Christian nationalists like to do. Uh, we all do. I, we do it in the church too. And we shouldn't, I will openly admit that, but it becomes an us versus them mentality. And so that's where this, this conversation is going to go towards is it shouldn't be us versus them. Should we be Christian nationalists? No, I'm, that's not what I'm advocating for. No. But should we be fighting against them, or should I, we be trying to to win them back, as we would win back the unsaved, or we would we win back our our fallen brother who has we should we should Matthew eighteen them and and show them through love the error of their ways. Yeah. Well, and the only reason why I, I didn't mean to keep interrupting what you were saying, Nate. The only reason I was doing that is because it kind of continues to underscore this philosophic overtone they have. Um, Cause like you said, like hearing that it sounds, it sounds good. And they do, they do connect to proof texts. Um, and I call them that very intentionally, uh, but 
that that just kind of shows I think there's a disconnect. At the very least, there's a disconnect. Yeah. In principle, they want what all Christians want, right? They want to see the kingdom of God come, and yeah. they would like to see it come in, in the realization of America becoming a, like a truly Christian nation run by Christians. Yeah. However, the biblical example is not really that. Also, yeah. it might start from here's the, and here's I got to be careful here because there are some post millennialists that I I can deal I, with. I was um, just about to mention this. Anyway, Doctor James White, who is a post millennialist, is Which not is, a Christian nationalist by any means. That is interesting to me. I'm sorry. Um, continue. Well, no, that he's a post millennialist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I know. I find that interesting. But that he's not a Christian I, nationalist. I, I no, never. I, I no. Yeah, I'm not surprised that. I'm saying the first thing. The po- yeah. Yeah. But, 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 but one can definitely lead to the other, right? Like being a post-millennialist and, and hoping that we win enough people. Like if we great commission ourselves, not to death, but like if we all lived out the great commission to the fullest of our abilities, could we win the entire world for Christ or win this whole entire country for Christ? Maybe. Would that be great? Yeah. But is that what Christian nationalists want? Not really. Well, and I, in theory, yes, but in practice and in principle, no. Yeah, and, and it's funny because I, I was just about to mention the post mill like influence. Not that all post mill, post millennials hold to this, but it set, tends to lend itself to that. <coughs> what I mean by that is every single Christian national like nationalist advocate I have met. I'm talking like maybe if you call them scholars or or, or pastors, are post mill. I don't think that's a coincidence. So I would say. Yeah, all I would say most, if not all, Christian nationalists are post millennialists. I would say the converse is not true. Just because you're a post millennialist does not make no, you of a course. Christian nationalist. No, of course, that's what I was trying to outline. Yeah. Um, but here's here's the end all be all. And we were having this conversation earlier, and I I might draw a firmer line than others, and that's fine. And you may disagree with me, and that's fine. Again, this is do your homework kind of thing. We're just yeah. giving you our opinions and our research on this. Um, do I think because of their, the way in which they seek power, the way that which they value power, um, the way that which they marginalize people who are not Christians, um, do I think that the Christian nationalist movement is Christian? No, I, I would say it's very much not, um, it's cloaked under Christian. You put you put the name of Jesus on something, it does not automatically make it Christian. And I think that that's where they're at. Um, I also think they falsely invoke it and they proof text. But that's that's another issue. Do I think the leaders are Christians? Again, I don't speak to people's hearts. I would say it is far more likely that the leaders of these organizations and um, political think tanks um, <clears throat> are not Christian, even though they probably like to think that they are. Um, I think they're, they've made some grievous errors in, in subjugating the, the sovereignty of Christ and the truth and sufficiency of Scripture. Um, do I think that people can be Christians and be Christian nationalists? That's a little bit more gray area, but I would say the same is true of Catholics. I would say the Pope and probably the upper echelon of the Catholic Church is probably not saved. Do Are there Catholic churches and priests that maybe are and, and really believe the truth even though they're under the Catholic Church? Yeah. Absolutely, but I think that goes without saying. But should we still continue to have these conversations with our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, or out of Christ, right? It's just another avenue, right? It, whether you want to call it a mission field or, or re-discipling people who have kind of gone astray, it is, is still something that we need to address in, in that manner. It's not, well, they would tell you it's us versus them, and they're very, very charged in that way. Um, for us, for Christians, it should never be us versus them. We want everybody to be us. Yeah, absolutely. Do we want everybody to be saved? We should, because that's what God wants, right? We should. God wants everybody to be saved. Could, do we save people through force? I don't think that's how that works. Ask the Nazis. <laughs> you you can't. People aren't saved through force. They they have to make that choice. And it's also a stark reminder that the it's the Holy Spirit that convicts of sin. It is only our job to bring them the gospel, right? And and to show them the gospel and the love of Christ. So I think you can tell where the show is going. You probably knew already. Um, it is Christian nationalism is dangerous, honestly. It's dangerous for a couple of reasons. Um, and Andrew, I think, is going to get into the, into why it's so dangerous. 
But I, I, I really think that we really need to be on our guard from this, especially, and it probably ebbs and flows, especially now we're in seasons of election. Like it's probably stronger now than it's ever been. Will it probably ebb a little bit after the election's over, depending on the way the election yeah. goes? I mean, look at January 6th. Look what happened there. <clears throat> the election didn't go our way. I shouldn't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't. Us versus them, uh, my brother. Our way. The election did not go the way of the Republicans. And so January 6th happened. And was everybody that was a part of that, quote unquote, insurrection, a member of the Christian nationalism movement? No. Were there some based on the T-shirts and the flags that were waving? Probably. And so that's a little that's cause for concern. Right. So if this election goes that way again, we could see some more of this stuff. Now, again, we could also see some more of this stuff if the election goes the way they want. If Trump is reelected, they could just, you know, they could start this movement of, hey, of trying to push the government to start taking control of more things. And that's where I'm torn on, like, Trump's plan here. Because I don't know how much truth is in that. I've never seen the document. I don't know if it's ever been released. What are you talking about? The, like, I don't know what it's even called. This document for, like, when Trump takes over that's supposedly been leaked about, like, he's going to have a national abortion ban and all these things. I don't Project 2025 or something? Oh, well, he, he just... To be clear, he's disavowed that like five times publicly and said he has nothing. That's not his people and he has nothing to do with that. Right. So and, again, and based on his, but the same is based on some of his statements on certain things. I would tend to agree that that's not his, but anyway, sorry, you were saying, but either way, it's yeah. one of those things like what's going to happen. Cause some of those things in that document that are supposedly from him are very conveniently Christian nationalist. Um, a national abortion ban, things like that. That would be something that the Christian nationalists would very much prefer for. Now, would I love to see an abortion ban? Yes. Sorry if I sound like I'm questioning that. Like, I don't want to see innocent babies killed. Do I know? If, do I think that's the way to go about it, though? What's a ban going to do? Because here's the thing. It's like gun control. If you take the guns out of people's hands, criminals are still going to find a way to get them. Yeah, but then you and you can punish the criminals. But I, I do I do get your point though. But can you though? What do you mean? I mean, we don't. I don't want to talk about. We're not going to get into the failings know, well, of the American justice system. But like, yeah. Well, it, but again, the fact this of the is, matter is in, those in, things still in happen. theory. In theory, you'd punish them. Yes, if you catch them. But how many of things go uncaught and they're done in no, secret? No, that's a fair point. I'm just, uh, yeah, now I hear what you're saying. Because that becomes a very, like, abortion <sighs> bans and things like that become Sorry, I just cracked my very... Head for those heard. We, like to, we like to support them because of quote-unquote Christian ethics. And yes, we don't want to support the systemic, like, systemic racism or systemic the systemic uh, practice of abortion. We definitely don't want to support things like that, but at the same time, we just need to be careful of like calling for abortion bans and calling for gun control and calling for these things that oh, two things. One are still going to happen. And two, like that's not your evangelism. You, you supporting or voting for a national abortion ban is not your evangelism. You want, you want to fight abortion, go counsel somebody who's questioning having an abortion or who has had an abortion. Go have those conversations. Go pray for those people. You mean go to the mission field? Something like that. But that's that's so, that's the it's entirely opposite. Like they want to uh, the to simplify this a little bit before we get into how dangerous it is, they really want to just force Christianity down everybody's throat and assume that people will follow it versus actually making disciples. Like they skip making disciples and they just want to teach them to obey everything that he's commanded well that doesn't it, work we're yeah, doing it, things out of order we need to make disciples first and to make disciples we don't need to just implement a bunch of laws yeah no and, and i think too there are some that they view this as making disciples but i think that they have their praxis a bit off um, that that would be my sentiment um, i want you i want what's that because making disciples i mean was a disciple it's a christian it's a follower of christ right so making those things does not come about by. Oh, of course, I'm not advocating. I'm just saying. I, I think know. That's their I'm mis just yeah. saying, right? You don't. You don't. So, 
I would like to read a first. quote. Let, let me know what you think. This Uh-oh. is from a Christian nationalist. I'm not going to give any names, but there's a couple more like this I'm going to be reading throughout the show as we kind of talk about these things. So here's the quote. When evangelicals discuss the physical courage required of men, they are quick to point to the martyrs, but are slow to talk about men like Godfrey of Bullion or Richard the Lionheart. Why is that? Why is getting killed promoted over righteously taking life in defense of a life? That's, that's the quote. Um, do we read the Bible? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Is that too much? No. I, that, I, just, just, I, I just threw I, the quote I, out there. I, I, my head hurts. Jesus said you will suffer, not that you will cause people to suffer. Did I, did I miss that? You will be persecuted. You will not be the persecutors. Yeah. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Well, what, what am I missing here? Yeah. I'm just, I, I, I think I'm getting, I'm just trying not to be mad, but like, it's just, it's, uh, it's mind boggling. But here's the thing. When we, when we talk about politics and we talk about, uh, I liken Christian nationalism to like the prosperity gospel, right? The, whether they know, I'd say whether they know it or not, but I'm pretty sure they know it. They've made their money and they've made their power by preying on people who are disenfranchised, preying on people who are radicalized by certain things because humans are humans. And in doing so, they've attached these emotions and these feelings to things that they shouldn't be attached to. Like they get people so fired up about things. And it's like, should we really be fired up about these things? Let's be rational for a second, but we just let our emotions go wild as, as humans. And it's just All right. so, bizarre. So I have another quote and, I'll, and I'm going to start. I, I'm doing this for a reason. I'm sure you can understand why. Um, this is from this, this post I can say is from not a Christian nationalist. From, from not a Christian nationalist. Yeah, just, okay. just, to set, just to set the scene. Many Christians are worldly, forgetting the words of Paul. For our struggle is not against the flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. To be clear, 90% of this post is a direct quotation of Ephesians 6.12. And this is kind of in line, um, in a response, I should say, I'm trying to th- make sure I understand this. Um, essentially, talking about the rise of amongst Christians in the in the sphere of influence of Christian nationalism to take up arms to to quell the rebel invaders. These, this kind of knowledge. That's what this was kind of his his kind. And it was not in a condescending way. I know I know the specific uh, pastor that posted this. It, it was meant like a, a loving reminder. Here is the response. You ready? This tell me if this sounds how this sounds. This kind of word, warm tongue pietism can go straight to hell. It is good to be conquered, raped, and pillaged by the enemy. This is godliness. That's his, that's the response. I don't have any words yeah. for that. Well, I, I I share these. I'm sure Nate kind of and I hope the audience kind of gets where I'm going with this. We're talking about why is this dangerous? Now, to be clear, just as the definitions we were reading, there are a plethora of definitions, but there is a plumb line, right, that we need to be aware of. Now, predominantly, as we can kind of, what do these posts kind of show you, Nate? I'm, I'm more of a question. Not, 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 not specifics, just in general. What do, what do this show you as far as, I'm trying to think of a way to word this, right? I'll just give the answer. Um, <laughs> as far as, treating groups of people um i mean it's pretty clear that they care about themselves it's pretty clear that they want to make everybody fall in line quote unquote and it seems like they will use i don't want to say any means necessary but they distort distort scripture to do so so yeah. borderline like any means necessary well, which sounds very and did you notice a lord of the rings overtone to those kind of responses, eh. like worm tongue. Well, they, I, I, the, straight up in that whole conversation thread, it's a lot of it is like quoting Lord of the Rings. So here's the thing, that doesn't bother me. There's a re- I, it doesn't bother me either, but there's a reason he's doing it. Well, I'm sure there is, but it's probably the same reason that I do it. 
Maybe not. It, well, it, again, it's talking about wor- who, who is Worm Tongue in Lord of the Rings. I, I promise this is relevant. He's the he's a bad guy. Yeah, the, the King Theoden, right? Yeah. So, and the, this idea of open waters upon him, and he's trying to advocate him to to turn his blind eye, like that's kind of the reference and the vein in which he's making these comments, right? So he's quoting it more from a war perspective, a physical war, not so much a spiritual war. Um, I think that's the that's the allegory he's trying to use there. That's dumb. I'm not saying I. I think it's good. I'm just saying that seems to be the overall plumb line and theme of those posts. Granted, I may or may not have used the Lord of the Rings reference at a time or two for a different reasons. Yeah, I was about to but... say it's not. I'm not upset with the use of the Lord of the Rings. I'm not. That's not my. That's not my upset, or that's not my point. My point was more pertaining to the con- the specifics and the substance of it. Okay. Um, so anyway, well, the reason again we talk about why is it so dangerous? I think that, I think the, even these a couple quotes, and there's more I will read as we kind of continue. But why it's so dangerous? That sounds rather tribalistic, does it not, to you? I mean, yeah, I would say, yeah, it's it's tribalistic. We look at the ideas of, I mean, for our audience to get some context here when we talk about tribalism, there are three kind of schools of thought when it comes to um <clears throat> Uh, how not not society operates but like how people in power operate how societies are based on like so let me just just say it and we can figure out how to describe it later um so there's in the west we live in a society right now that is guilt innocence right this is exactly where i was going so good continue (laughs) and that's just how we understand things right in collectivist cultures because we're very individualistic so everything is guilt or innocence it's one it's based on the guilt of innocence of one person in collective societies it's all about honor and shame to you to your family to your social group whatever it is it's honor and shame based the tribalism comes in a little bit more in like african nations and like very spiritualistic maybe even like native american groups as well um but it's this idea of um forgive me if i misquote this but like fear and power no what is it fear oh yeah sorry it is yeah at. fear power you're right this this the yeah tribalism, this the fear, fear and power. power dynamic right so this idea that basically to i mean the way it ends up in practice is to to main to have and maintain power is to basically rule through through fear um, it's very animalistic and very spiritual in its sense, but it's also very like us versus them kind of mentality, right? It's not so much. Um, I'm just going to read it. I have it right here. Oh, do you want to read that for me? Which one? Which, which The side? fear power culture. Yeah. Fear power culture is referred to animistic contexts, typically tribal or African, where people are afraid of evil and harm. Uh, right, sorry, let me re- re- say that. People where people afraid of evil and harm pursue power over the spirit world through magical rituals. Right. So we're not talking about magical rit- rituals, but they are un- afraid of quote unquote evil, and in order to and they view evil as like non-Christian, basically, and yeah. so to get rid of non-Christians and quote unquote, and I use that term very specifically to get rid of Christian non-Christians to overcome evil in this world and to, to rid it of all the, the harm that the evil in this world does and the sin that this world does. They feel that taking power of the American government is their, their way to do so. Right. But two things happen. One, it's not, that seems like very means to an end, which in and of itself is not great. But realistically, like the way they talk, the way they act, if they take power, will they ever give it up if things work out the way they want? Or will they just continue to stay in power for themselves and for the benefit of their own group that they support and and cherish and whatever else? (laughs) Yes, no, I I, I, I agree. And and that's kind of what like these quotes and quibs like I'm trying to let them speak for themselves and not put words in their mouth. Now for this next example, 
and we're going to talk, I'm sure Nate probably hit on this too, but we're going to move on to the methods and how, while some of them might, and I, I identify, some of them might mean well, they might just be misguided. Because for example here, we'll talk about that in a moment actually, but in the past couple months, there's just been this big craze amongst the Christian nationalists defending the Crusades and saying how we need to, you know, really embolden the Crusades. We need to have another crusade, like all, like really, really upholding the, this idea of the Crusades, um, which respectfully I think is a bit redu like a, a bit reductive because there was multiple over many hundred, many hundred years, um, all with different purposes. And they were specifically talking about them quelling the Islamic invader and how that was biblical and all, you know, and actually Dr. James White, I think I'll use his name because we mentioned him in the previously, uh, I think did a very loving job of refuting it. Um, and they got very upset with him. And to be, and to be fair, some people are very, don't have, don't maintain a good witness in their response to these guys. I'm not saying we should hate them or, or, or um, respond with vitriol, which t I, I do notice, and I, I want to be fair about that. They, they do receive a lot of vitriol, which I think is not appropriate either. It's okay to be upset and angered and righteously angered about some of the things that are being said, but we need to m maintain a proper witness. But um, how, how they go about doing this and why it's dangerous, why this is, is pervasive. I think you've kind of noticed this theme of, well, when you hear it on paper, on some of them at least, it sounds like you would agree with it. They, almost like you would agree with it. Um, but we see this common method where they, well, they will distort God's word. We, and you heard me use the word proof text earlier. Nate, do you mind? Well, what is a proof text? Help me out with this rhetoric here. It is... I mean, first of all, it's eisegesis. It is. Yeah, that's... No, it yeah. is literally just taking scripture that seems to support your point of view, typically ripped out of context uh, more often than not, and, and used to make it sound like you, one, know what you're talking about, and two, and you have biblical support for what you're talking about. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I wanted to, I wanted to involve Nate on that one. But um, you see this idea of using proof text, and they, they will do this. They'll, they'll distort God's word. Um, and that is something that we see throughout this idea of proof text throughout, even like that, um, statement, the affirmations and denials, many of those texts, uh, texts they used recited at the end were proof texts. Um, I'm trying to see, I don't want to go too in depth at every point here, but. And then sometimes they get there by hermeneutical magic, which is a point that's used as well, another method, which, Nate, I don't know, you look like you had something to say. Nope. Oh, sorry. So my, I'm going to read a quote here, and just this whole block, bear with me. Hermeneutical magic. My friend James, I'm not going to say his full name, speaks of hermeneutical magic. Hermeneutics, as you may know, is the art of interpreting scripture. He says that magicians rely on distraction and sleight of hand to accomplish their goals. They are, they are skilled at directing your gaze where they want so that they can achieve their deception. In the same way, American Christian nationalist leaders use scripture to misdirect the attention of their audience. I've seen it happen many times, and it often involves boldly misquoting scripture by strategically replacing one or two words to change the meaning of the text, or ripping a text out of context and applying it in a way that the original authors would never have advocated. So and then he, he cites proof texting as one of the hermeneutical magics, which we already kind of talked about. So and I think this is relevant. So it kind of ties in, Nate, stop me if you think you need to. But the, let's consider this following list of uh, voting priorities frequently seen online or in chain emails. Notice how the scripture citations are next to each statement, giving the impression that each phrase is of a legitimate application of the text. Notice, too, what is absent, and we'll talk about this in a second. How, how I will vote in November. This is like this chain emails. I will vote for the most pro-life candidate because God hates the shedding of innocent blood, Proverbs 6.17. I will vote for the most pro-Israel candidate because God blesses those who bless Israel and curses those who don't, Genesis 12.3. I will vote for the most pro-debt reduction candidate because the borrower is, is a servant to the lender, Proverbs 22.7. I will vote for the most pro-work candidate because God says if, I, if a man won't work, let him not eat. 2 Thessalonians 
I will vote for the most pro-marriage candidate because God is for marriage as defined in the Bible, Genesis 2.24. I will vote for the candidate who most closely believes the government's purpose is to reward good and punish evil, Romans 13. I will vote based as close as I can on God's word, 2 Timothy 3. Now, some of these sound pretty good. I mean, based on just hearing the sentence, um, give or take, I, I would contend the Israel one is a little more complicated than, than this sentence proclaims. But notice what's missing. Any scripture relating to care for the poor, immigrant, widow, prisoner, or orphan, or texts that speak about the responsibility of leaders to have moral integrity. And I, I, I shared that specific last sentence about moral integrity because you often hear, and this gets me a little frustrated, but you often hear, I'm voting for president, not America's pastor. That is almost always used to justify severe moral failings of a candidate that, that the, for whatever reason, a specific group might have propped up as the Christian's choice. Um, I hear that often when I when I'm in conversation. Again, I, I don't go out to attack, but I, you know I'll hear these conversations and I'll, I'll engage in them lovingly as best to, to, that I can. But that is often what I'm met with if I ever push back on certain candidates um, and their obvious moral failings in light of the uh, uh, other side. And I'll hear, "Well, I'm voting for America's president, not not for America's pastor." And it's like that. You nope, missing the point. <laughs> um, and we see that, again, this all kind of exemplifies the distortion of the Christian witness. It's not, beloved, it's not what we do. Um, it is what we do, but it's also how we do it and why we do it. And too often, those, are, those key, um, that triad, if you will, is, is devoid or separated and, and dissected. And that's a mistake, Especially when it comes to the civic realm, we try to go. Oh well, you know, if we can get one, we'll, we'll do the right thing. But it doesn't really matter how it's done, or um, that's 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 misguided and not proper. And we need we need to to not fall into that trap. It's very tempting. I'm not I'm not this way. I'm not trying to suggest that that it's not tempting when you feel nervous. And that's another thing that happens is you're made to feel nervous. It's fear of impending doom, impending struggle, impending suffering, and, and we need to do something. We need to do something. It's like the Crusades. And we'll pull events out of history out of context as well. Or we'll highlight only what's convenient and leave out all of the rest, which, again, would be ignoring context. I just say this as a word of caution because it's easy to fall into that. Nate, do you have anything to add? I think we see that a lot in history, too. We call it like whitewashing history. If you look at ancient texts on like the Akkadians and the the Hittites and all these these nations, we get we get the good, right? We hear all these great exploits. It's very redacted. But when we get the biblical history of Israel, we see the good and the bad. And I think with Christian nationalism, we see the very thing, the same thing, right? We see all the good. We see all these other things it can do, but we we fail to see the mistakes and the errors. And we talk, we want to talk about the Crusades, but we don't want to talk about all the bad stuff that the Crusades brought and, and the bad things that happened because of the Crusades. Yeah. We just want to talk about how, oh, that's Christians taking control. Yeah. Okay. That, just because it fits your narrative. Exactly. No, I think that's a very good point. And, and, and I like this example that, that um, Campbell points out here. If the story of ancient Israel tells us anything, it's that religious government and laws do not produce God-honoring people in and of themselves. More often than not, these religious leaders become corrupted, distorting the witness of godliness, generating more evil in the world under the guise of piety and holiness. I think that's quite an interesting and, and apt example. Um, and, and, that's, and that's partly why, and another reason why I would contend why Christian nationalism can be dangerous is there are many definitions of Christian nationalism. Um, and we have to be careful and try to and, and engage in being specific. And that's one thing about the definitions we were reading from this website that I appreciated. It was that they were very open. I will give them the credit for that. They were very open. They were honest. They sought to be as straightforward as they could be. And I appreciated that. I think that's another thing that kind of makes um, this whole thing delicate. We have to be we have to be aware, and it makes it it can make it dangerous. Um, and make it, again, make us have to be delicate and aw hyper aware of how we're interacting and how we are reacting 
um, in light of these things. Because again, as we, as we can, I'll, I'll bring this up one last time. As we heard, these things sound good. Some of it sounds proper. Um, and then it really comes, and what, what, this is why I have, sometimes I have a problem is even with definitions, it really comes down to the praxis and how, in other words, how they're going to apply these principles. That's where you really kind of start to see it, which is why I was reading these quotes from people uh, on um, these, their, their sites because that it really becomes evident then. Um, and you see it, like their, their big thing, there's also... Unfortunately, I'd have to do a lot of research, uh, not a lot, but I have to do a lot of scrolling. Um, there's also this big push for maintaining like, ethno states and like, the F, like that's important and God, that's part of God's plan, and which is just not true. I really don't know how else to put that. Um, but in light of all of this, Nate, and maybe we can obviously discuss, but how, how do we handle this? How should we... In, interact with this, knowing that it's dangerous, knowing what it is, how should we begin to prepare to interact with it? Lovingly. Sorry. I, I, I think that's really the way to do it. And I think it's a, a great chance to witness and to be, to have conversations. The subtitle of the book we're reading from, um, we're not gonna give you the title yet, but the subtitle says loving your Christian nationalist neighbor. And I think, I think that, that, that just says it right there. And so the, the guy who wrote this book, um, really spent a lot of time among Christian nationalists with Christian nationalists doing his research, not just researching websites, but researching people and leaders and, and he going to some very good job of talking um, about that. I did really, yeah, he does a very, he's very thorough. Um, also I would say very loving in how he presents it. Yeah. So one thing I want to do real quick is he offers a field guide to con- conversating with a Christian nationalist. And, I, we're going to do one, I actually want to walk through with one example of like a proof text that, that he uses and that there that they use and he kind of compats against and then kind of some other tips that he gives to, to, to help disarm. And, and that's really about what it is too, is like, because like Christian nationalists come armed, right? They come hot and heavy a lot of the times. They don't really want to be open to conversation. They're very... I mean, Christian, some people accuse Christians of being closed minded too, but like they seem very closed minded of like very rigid in their beliefs. And they, they're very just like this undying loyalty to this cause or to this leader or whatever it is. Um, but to actually have conversations about this is important, but he advocates for things like clarifying questions, um, agreeing on shared values, um, using words or phrases that communicate that you either agree or disagree. Um, good things to honor as far as parts of like this conversation go and then humble subversion subversion right which can help continue to grow this um, conversation uh, he admits that these are not scientific categories these are just kind of tips to to get basically to get you started right it's like an evangelism kind of how to of like here's some tools to get you started but you got to go do it you got to figure out what works for you what figure out how to do it um, their statements change over time, so we have, we have to adapt to that as well. Um, and there are no, these are not debate tactics. We're not looking to debate these people. This is not what it's about. Well, I think there is a place for Christian debate. I don't think this is it. Um, so if we would, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter. I have it pulled up here. Uh, Luke chapter 22. Uh, we'll start in verse 35. But he only cites uh, Luke twenty two thirty six. Uh, Luke says, and he said to them, talking about Jesus, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So that's through verse 38. That's context, right? But they like to just say, read verse 36. says, And he said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. Guess what they're advocating for? The Second Amendment, right? So they, 
it, it's and that's the thing. He even points this out there. Like it seems like if if you read just this verse that Jesus is advocating that they obtain weapons. But then among the, the 13 of them, well, actually it's probably 12 because Judas probably isn't with them, I think, at this point. Because um, he's already gone to pray, so I think Judas is gone. So just the 12 of them. Among the 12 of them, they have two swords. Not everyone has a sword. And that, he says, is enough. And it is okay. an... Ac- sorry, sorry. sorry. No, and so if it's enough, two swords is enough for 12 people. I, I, there's there, That should be said. Something should be said of that. What was to be fulfilled, though? Um... I'm pretty sure the verse before talks about, well, Jesus foretells Peter's denial. Yeah. And I think he's kind of alluding to he's going to be taken. Um, Sorry. I, was, I, just I don't think it's relevant mind. to the context, honestly. Okay. At least for this discussion. Say, it doesn't matter what's being fulfilled. He's clearly not talking about guns. And he's clearly not talking about everybody should own a sword. And that's really why, uh, that, that's the important part. So some clarifying questions he offers is, tell me, or, or statements that are like leading questions or like, tell me why this is important to you. Like, why is this verse important? Why are guns important to you? Um, what do you think it means to buy a sword today? Why do you think Jesus said this to his disciples? Are there other portions of scripture that show Jesus talking about the use of weapons? Huh? Interesting. Um, possible shared values that you could, it would, you could come to an agreement on safety for the people I love. As a, as a means for having, that's why the disciples maybe wanted swords. That's maybe why Peter pulled his sword is, is to defend the person he loved in Christ. Uh, loving others by protecting them from harm. You could find common ground on either owning guns or not being against gun ownership. Um, about not being a pacifist if you're not. No need to lie here. Um, you can always stay from it. Um, there are also some things we probably shouldn't say. We probably just shouldn't say... Uh, the government should make firearms legal to own or people with guns are mentally unstable. Um, he also mentions earlier, he has not included statements such as you are out of your mind or that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Uh, I assume you know that these are not healthy nor strategic. Good things to honor. Safety from harm is a core human need. The desire to stop people from committing acts of violence is good. Um, humble subversion though, right? Before... One, we have to read the scripture in context, right? But then the, we, and we already read this, right? The disciples said, see, Lord, here are two swords. And he said, that is enough. And then they went to the Mount of Olives to pray. And then he was betrayed, right? Jesus comes up to him. And then guess what? Um, when Jesus' followers saw what was going on, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. And Jesus responded, no more of this. He touched the, per- the man's ear and healed him. Notice that Jesus did not call his followers to take up arms against the mob that came to arrest him. Instead, he tells them to put their swords away. He even heals the victim of the disciples' violent action. Uh, the Gospel of Matthew's account of this scene adds these words, put your sword back in its place, for all who draw the sword will, be, will die by the sword. When we read in context, we discover that Jesus undermines the power of the sword. Now he he offers some questions here that are important. So he said, I'm so glad. So here's just one example. He offers like 10 of them. He says, I'm so glad that you care deeply about the safety of your family and your community. I too believe protecting ourselves from others and others from violence is a good thing. I also know that Jesus warned his followers about the deceptive and destructive power of violence. Remember when he said all those who draw the sword will die by the sword? He also said things like turn the other cheek and even gave himself over to people who wanted to kill him. I feel conflicted about my desire for safety and the call of Jesus to put down our swords. What do you think? I, and I, so that's, that's the, the purpose here though, is these, these tools, these, these examples he gives are conversation starters. Right. We don't I don't want to go to somebody who's blatantly misinterpreting scripture and just say, hey, you're wrong. You're misinterpreting scripture because what's the, what's the knee jerk reaction always going to be? No, you're wrong. And we're just going to argue about that. What's the point? Right. You can't somebody who's blinded by sin or somebody who doesn't know they're sinning. Or even somebody who does is not going to see the error of their ways unless the Holy Spirit convicts them. It's not our job to convict of sin. It's just our job to make disciples. And the easiest way to make disciples is to have genuine conversations. That is really just the way to go. 
And so he presents a, a bunch of other case studies about theological issues and conspiracy theories and and all these other things that that you'll run up against with Christian nationalists. And so I think the the book itself is worth a good read. Um, but something that's not in here is um, Paul's example. I mean, he 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 touches on Paul here and there. But like Paul's example of all the things that Paul had to face it, that the government oppressed him doing and his response could have been violence and it never was. And, and the, the, there's no call to be in charge and Paul never sought to be in charge. Paul went before the emperor and not that we know everything that was said, but for all we know, he didn't try and change the emperor's mind on anything. He just appealed to his Roman citizenship. Um, Many of the apostolic fathers also held to that example. Yeah, we and we look at all the martyrs in, in church history before yeah. the Crusades. Um, he also suggests things, um, and, and really wrestling with these things, about taking a media fast, um, doing some book studies, and he recommends some books here that we were. I'm not going to go through. Um, but you can read them. There's some. There's plenty of books out there. Just, again, you have to read these with diligence. Be wary of who the author is and what their perspective is before you read. Um, <clears throat> sometimes the title will give it away. Sometimes it won't. Um, doing Bible studies on things like the kingdom of God, um, 30 days of prayer before you enter the mission field, things like that. He also has his own website, um, but he also like says there is hope. Like He's dealt with this. He is dealing with this. Um, unfortunately, members of people who've chosen to follow Christian nationalism could be members of your own household. Um, members of your church could, could start to sway to this ideology. And so how do we address this even in our own church, in our own families is, is it is possible though. And so that's, that's the ultimate call is, is this is discipleship. This is evangelism. This is mission work. This is witnessing. It is whatever, kind of however you believe whether they're Christian or not, but it, it's in any way, it's really, it's this. I would say there's four things. I, I've summarized it my own way. Um, to really understand them and their issues and, and to reach them is to, to ask questions, to be loving, but not be wavering in the truth, to be prayerful. And oh, I guess the fourth one is to stand for truth. <laughs> um, I got ahead of myself a little bit, right? And so those things really can make all the difference. And and the same would be true of, of non-Christian nationalists, right? Of of just the unsaved, or if you're doing mission work, which is still the unsaved, but like in a different country, of learning their culture, learning their, to speak their language, learning to be able to find what you can, what common ground you can find, to be able to speak the truth into their lives in a way that matters. And so the name of the book We'll give away spoilers now as we come to a close. Is It's called Disarming Leviathan, Loving Your Christian Nationalist Neighbor by Caleb E. Campbell. And I am I, I am very happy that I read this. Um, I always get, I didn't, I don't know anything about the author before I read this. And so it allowed me kind of an open mind as, as far as, like I knew what the book's about, clearly. It's very, very clear about. But, I don't know his, like, I'm not familiar with his teachings or any of his other works. Um, or like if I read a book by like MacArthur or Sproul or Begg, like I know what they stand for. So like, I know what I'm getting into before I read it. This one I didn't. And so I was able to, to read it with an open mind. And I think it's, it's worth a read. Um, I think it's very good to, to start conversations, to start thinking about these things. There are, like I said, there are other books that talk about politics and religion and Christian nationalism and there's probably plenty more that I'll end up reading, depending on, on how far I get into this. But um, I think it's a good book. I, I think he, he he touches on some things, and he really hits home on some important facts of, like, we need to be founded in the truth of Scripture and live by the truth of Scripture in context. We don't quote mine. We don't prove text. We don't, we don't do hermeneutic. He said hermeneutical magician, but like there's also people who just do hermeneutical backflips and gymnastics, and, and yeah, just it's the same difference. Massacre the text, right? And so we need to we need to think through those things and be prayerful about those things. But we also need to forget that Christian nationalists are not our enemy. Yeah, uh, Paul said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the powers and, and principalities of yes. this world. And that yes, 
And there's, I honestly, I think he hit, he points out that there's spiritual things going on behind behind the scenes that are inherently evil, um, and he doesn't like overtly compare them to like the Third Reich, but like the, there's some things that are kind of along those lines of like we look at authoritarian government that even though it's for the right purpose of this ethno cleansing of we want the Aryan race and we want to do the right things, the, this means to an end led to the massacre of six million Jews, and so what is the not that they, they have an answer, but the question would be for some of these Christian nationalist leaders is what is the means to the end? What Where do you draw the line of what do I need to do to get power? Because yeah. there has there should be a line. And if there's not, then, then we're, no, we're really playing dangerous game. Yeah. It's dangerous enough as is, but I wonder how dangerous game they, they really know they're playing. Um, and as my grandfather always said, if you play with fire, you're going to get burned. Sorry. I, I, <laughs> I've heard that one way too many times, but sometimes it just fits. So I think it's a good place to stop. Um, I think you, we've made very clear how we feel about um, Christian nationalism as a movement and, a, and, and the falsehoods that are in, inherent in it, but also that like the people who are a part of it are, are people. They're not devils. They're not necessarily, you know, they're not our enemy. They're not Satan. And so we need to do what we can to, to bring them back into the truth. You're making funny faces. Yeah, I'm reading a quote. Sorry. Oh, boy. In line with this. Well, and yes, that's... I, I think we did do a very good job um, of, of giving a brief warning. And again, I hope I hope you see how we're setting this. It's, it's important. And I tried my best even when I was reading some of their quotes. They, they, they do receive vitriol, and that is, that is wrong for people who, who are Christians, who say they're Christians and Bible Christians. The way we do things matters. So it's, and I think they did a very good job of hammering that point. And I said that it does matter how we approach this. Um, I have a very interesting conversation after the show, actually. I want to talk about Luke 22. Interesting. But um, I just wanted to share that with you all so you know that we talk about Scripture and we're pious men. I don't know if I'd say maybe pious isn't the right word. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I hope now our listeners know that sometimes I throw in an occasional joke, but um, we do appreciate you being with us for this. And again, hopefully we did our we sought to do the best we could in laying a foundational understanding of Christian nationalism. We encourage you to continue searching. If you have questions about where to search, we will be more than happy to provide them. Um, we just don't want to color your opinion and views on things by sharing where we're reading from. But we do have, there's quite a few of them. We'll ha- be more than happy to email out to you if you have questions. You can email us at fortitudeandtruth316 at gmail.com. And that email is good, obviously, for prayer requests, questions. It can be questions on this show, questions on any other show, whatever it might be. Like I said, prayer requests, questions, concerns. We're more than happy to dialogue with you. We hope that our care for you guys, all who listen, um, those we may know, those we have no idea, um, we, we do take this stuff seriously and we, we care. Um, and we hope that this show has been a blessing. We look forward to next week where we'll be talking about voting. So without further ado, I will go ahead and I'm going to read the focused passage of the day. And I'm going to ask my dear brother in Christ here to pray for us briefly. Our focus passage today is Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Holy Scripture says, But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. I am with you always, even to the the end of the age. Nate, would you mind closing for us in a brief prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time spent discussing your word your truth and how it impacts our lives as messy as they can be sometimes. Lord, we ask that you continue to give us discernment in this, this coming election season in the different movements and, and Christian nationalism and, and the f- left and the right. And how, what are we supposed to make of all this? Uh, heads or tails. Lord, we ask for you, your spirit to guide us, Lord, and we ask that you reveal things in your word as we continue to study that we might be informed by you and the things you desire for us, not by the world and what it desires for us. And it's in your holy, it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. As always, this has been Fortitude and Truth, and we are excited to get 
to our voting. To tell you who to vote for. <laughs> Next week. And we hope you'll join us again.